Hello, I'm Andy Briggs, and welcome to the Amazing Astronomical Alphabet, a weekly programme in which my Astro Radio co-presenter Daz and I will be talking about anything astronomy-related which begins with the week's letter of the alphabet. We'll each choose some things to talk about which are in some way related to the universe, but neither of us will know what the other has chosen. We will then reveal facts about them which are weird, strange, bizarre, or simply interesting. Well, welcome back, dear listeners, to uh, the amazing astronomical alphabet. Last week we started with the letter A, then logically this week we're going on to B. Hi, Daz, how are you? Uh, I'm great, thank you very much. Um, really enjoyed uh, last week, and uh, I hope we can carry on in the same vein this week, because I'm yeah, really looking forward to this. This is fun fascinating last week and i hope the readers thought so too as this is a new program on astro radio dear listeners um if you have any feedback comments suggestions death threats kidnap notes ransom demands anything like that don't hesitate to uh to put keyboard to paper and uh send us an email you can email me i am andy at astroradio.earth and we'd love to hear your thoughts on the program because only by getting feedback can we improve things so there we are before we get on to the letter B, however, last week we made, a, among other discoveries we both made last week, we made a rather interesting discovery that Daz is one of the few people in the Western world who has not seen the film 2001 A Space Odyssey. So I gave him some homework, obviously, to watch 2001 A Space Odyssey, to come back and to uh, give us his thoughts about it. So Daz, have you done your homework? Uh, yes, I have. Um, since that uh, disclosure, I've had to walk around with a paper bag on my head so people don't yeah, recognise me. Quite right too. Quite uh, right. I've been ostracised, ostracised from the village. Um, so Again. I've corrected that. And uh, yes, I did watch it. Um, and uh, I watched it on a well-known uh, provider. Uh, it cost me £3 and... Uh, when my first impression of watching it at the end of it, it was that that was two and a half hours of my life I will not be getting back. Oh, really? Um, yeah, I wasn't. Um, I tried when I, I when I watched it. I tried to put myself in the mindset of the uh, of, of of the time that it was actually um, uh, released, and that was nineteen sixty eight. Um, and also, I was trying to get to to forget everything that I've we we know about uh astronomy and everything uh, now um and that's how i try to approach it i watched it um it's fine i i think i was still looking for a storyline and there is a very thin vein of a storyline running through it i considered it to be sort of like clumsily put together the effects for the time were absolutely fantastic i thought they were really right good there, weren't they? um and but as i said i was i was looking for a storyline um and I, I was i was disappointed towards the end of it but then i thought sat down and i thought well i'm, I'm still thinking as somebody from today who knows knows what's going on mm. um and when I saw, I actually then decided, well, I'll do some read up on the, the actual film itself. And basically, one of the first things I came across was a, a quote from Arthur C. Clarke himself, because, um, of course, the film was produced by Stanley Kubrick. Yeah. And um, he said, uh, if you came out of the cinema thinking you get it, then they had failed. It was basically designed to be to get you thinking. It was uh, uh, to encourage you to think outside the box, think about what's going on. And so that's what I did. And I suddenly thought, well, 1968, 1969 was the actual release date, if I remember, in the general cinemas. Yeah. yeah. And it was that time that there was a lot going on, actually, because yeah. it was in 1969 that um, the first pulsars were discovered. And That's they were discovered great. by uh, Jocelyn Bell, who now is uh, Dame Jocelyn Bell Brunel. Mm -hmm. um, and she discovered the first four, not the first, just one, not two, not three, but four mm. pulsars. And of course, when they discovered the first pulsar, which, as we all know, is a, um, a dead star, which is a, 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 from 
the remains of a star from a supernova that's gone supernova, mm. which is a neutron star. It's got very high uh, magnetic fields, um, but they spin at a very silly rate, really fast. Uh, some of them are what they call millisecond pulses. Exactly. And um, at their poles, because of these magnetic fields, you, the, the magnetic field uh, congregates and it produces these beams. And yeah. they spin like a, a lighthouse. And if we're in line line with them, we can actually detect these signals. And they're just a blip, 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 a lot faster. Yeah. Um, but that's what pulsars are. Now, because we'd never seen anything like that before, can you remember what they were called, Andy? Oh, they were the, the first couple they called LGMs for little green men. Exactly. And, they thought uh, they were little green men. And uh, if you remember last week, we were talking about the Arecibo message. Yes, we were. And the effect it had on especially Sir Martin Ryle, who was at the time the uh, Royal Astro- uh, Astronomer. Yes. And his reaction when in 1974, um, Mr. Drake sent off his message into space with yeah, using the Arecibo, Arecibo telescope. Yeah, yeah. It. So. Yeah, I thought, well, at the time, it, it, this was all happening. This was all going on. So it was this timing was actually quite, quite what good. Um, uh, and as I said, watching it, um, it's full of symbolism. Um, there is also, uh, there's, there's a, a, a couple of times you see the crescent moon in line with the sun. Yes. And that's um, taken from, uh, let me just get this right, Zoroastrianism. Yes, um, which is for, uh, basically a following of the prophet Zorasti, Zorast. Yeah, that's Zorasti, right. That's right. And um, which predates Buddhism and Christianity, and the, and the, the it was basically designed around um, the struggle of between light and dark. So there's lots of symbolism in there. And one of the things that did also throw me is there was a very young Leonard Rossiter in there. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and that really, that really threw me because I, 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 all I remember him about is Rising Excuse Damp. Me. So that, that completely <laughs> threw Perrin, him. Yeah, Reggie Perrin, exactly. And of course, that completely threw me. Um, but he's yes, only, he's only on um, he's only on screen for a couple of minutes. But if you yeah. look at his performance is absolutely riveting. He plays yeah. it perfectly. Uh, yep. Every single mannerism, every single word is just absolutely perfect. Exactly. I mean, and also what he's talking about is, again, whether or not you disclose what you found to yeah. the public and things that's, like that. And that's, um, right. that's right. It was, it, it's, that, that was sort of the sort of thing. Um, so it was sort of like set in, there was something going on. It was being kept secret from the public and all that. Yeah. and things like that then of course then of course going through the film i saw um inklings of films like contact uh interstellar you know they were to come later and lots of other film, films films yeah. you had the you know the the homicidal uh computer um yeah. which basically um if i remember rightly reading the notes its age level was supposed to be about around about four yes that's right um and the the thing is they 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 uh, they didn't they, they made it a little bit older because they thought with killing a four year old which they have to do mm. um, and I know this not isn't a spoiler thing, a year um, thing, yeah yeah, yeah it's, it's um, this isn't a spoiler it's nineteen sixty eight I think um, <laughs> if you remember right at the end when Dave Bowman is shutting Hal down or at least his higher functions and um, Hal says that he w- came into being in 1992. So if that was meant mm. to be 2001, that would make him nine, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so but then, older, there was, as you say. Yeah, there, there was a big debate about what, how old they were going to represent it. But like you say, to kill a four-year-old, they thought would be too uh, emotional for some people and all that. But oh, yeah. yeah, it's like I said, it's full of it's full of symbolism. There's lots of things on that. And okay, as I said, it, 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 I didn't look at it... Um, how I should have done at the time and all that. And it is when you start analyzing it, it's very thought provoking Mm. about your first contact with aliens Mm. um, through uh, the obelisk. Mm. Um, And as I said, later on, um, that will become quite prominent in one of the, uh, the the things I've chosen for B. So yeah, it's in the end of the day. Yes, it was, um, 
bit of a grind. It's it's a bit clunky. It's a bit uh, long winded. And I'm glad, as you said, you did warn me uh, before that there was a piece where uh, for 35 minutes you just watch a guy jogging around. So which like thankfully a, was dropped from the final release. Yeah, <laughs> there was there was only about sort of like two minutes that was left in there of him. I mean that around. that was that was Kubrick. I mean he he was in no hurry to tell his stories. Yeah. Um, and his attention to detail was, was legendary. Yeah. And there's actually a book um, written by Arthur C. Clarke called The Lost Worlds of 2001, where he basically describes how the film was made. Yeah. And, um, and Kubrick was, um, th- there would have been the temptation to think that, that Kubrick was a bit tyrannical because of his obsessional mm-hmm. attention to detail. But apparently he was a very nice guy to work with, but he worked everybody really hard. Yeah. Um, but he never shouted at anybody, never told anybody off for doing anything wrong. So apparently he was a really nice guy. So I, th- I think we can both agree, can we not, that the, the special effects for 1968, I think, to be honest, they still haven't been bettered in a lot of cases. The, the, the spaceships and everything looked absolutely real. And that was because they use models and not CGI as they would these days, you know. And um, computer graphics always have that certain stylized quality that you can tell that it's computer yeah. graphics. Yeah. But the models they made in, in, in 2001, um, Kubrick uh, gave an edict when the film was finished that all the models were to be destroyed because he didn't want any future film directors using them in, in other films. Um, Mm. But which is sad. So we've lost all the originals. There's, there's one original. Yeah. Sorry. I'll just jump in there. And it actually, not all the, the um, uh, models were destroyed because apparently the pinwheel um, space station. Yeah. That we, of course you see the famous uh, where the, the, the transporter comes into it and yeah. you've got the blue Danube playing in the background and all that, mm. was actually filmed, uh, found several years later in a field. In a field. I know, I've That's seen the photograph. Right. And yes. then um, as soon as it was the, the, it was realised what it was and then a lot, along came a bunch of vandals and they totally destroyed it. So, yes, we yeah. did lose it. So yeah. the actual um, uh, instruction to destroy them wasn't actually followed through. It's, it's, and there is still somewhere... A, a copy, not the one used in filming, but a sort of a backup copy of the Orion moon shuttle mm. uh, that went on tour around the States to promote the film. And oh, it was okay. bought eventually by a private collector, but nobody knows what happened to it after that. So presumably that's still around somewhere. Yeah, because he also kept um, one of the uh, costumes of um, one of the apes, because originally the apes were supposed to be um, Australopithecus. Um, right. creatures which is a young version of um homo Everyone's. sapiens yes uh, but unfortunately they weren't so hairy um and he thought they thought well hang on but we're gonna have a bit of a problem with here with full-on nudity because mm. um they would have had to have been naked and things like that but uh, oh. so he made a hairier version of early man oh. um and he actually kept uh, the the suit he kept was one that was called moon gazer um right. uh, on moon watcher and oh. um he actually kept one of the, his uh, uh, costume. And as you said, as regards the uh, special effects, people ca- came away from that wondering how they got so uh, monkeys to behave so well and exactly. to do what they did. They actually thought they were real apes and all that. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it was all human beings. Uh, and that's thought to be the reason why that wonderful troop of actors who spent months learning to move and behave like like uh like apes uh that's why they it said that they never got an award for their work because people mm. thought that they were really apes exactly, i mean i must yeah. admit when i first saw it at the cinema and i'm what what age would i have been uh 10 or 11 um i i thought i thought two things i thought they were really apes i you know i didn't realize that they were actors secondly i thought that that had been filmed in africa mm. but it was all on a studio set yeah. And in fact, if you look at the Blu-ray version of 2001, um, they back projected the, the landscape against the, the foreground in the studio. 
And if you look at the Blu-ray version, you can clearly see the brush strokes on the screen yeah. where, where they, they went over it with a reflective coating. Yeah. Um, and, and that spoils it a bit for me now. But, but, yeah. Yeah. but also, I was going to say about the special effects, marrying Strauss with, with the, the, the spaceships and uh, the Earth shuttle and the Moon shuttle and, and the lunar base and everything, work of utter genius and yeah. I, I cannot hear the blue danube now without seeing yeah seeing this from 2001 yeah. you know i, I never mm. will be able to now but i thought the the music choices um were absolutely incredible absolutely incredible yeah. well, I'm, so glad you, um, I'm so glad that you uh you uh, you you know ended up liking it i guess in the end yeah yeah, it's, it, yeah. if you look at it how it's supposed to be presented how you're supposed to think then mm. yes it, it it worked it, it was thought provoking because just one thing do you know when um moon watcher throws the bone up into this the air yes. after they've killed the thing and then you see your first spaceship yes did you realize that that was actually a nuclear device? It wasn't actually a spaceship. Yes, because I read the book. <laughs> oh, okay then. It's, it's yeah, not cause... apparent in the film. Yeah, because at the end, um, when you get the space child, yeah. um, at the end, uh, the the alternative ending was he was, was going to detonate all, those, all the nuclear bombs on the earth. All the nuclear bombs. Now, whether or not that was just to get rid of the nuclear bombs or it was to destroy man, not really sure no i think because uh, yeah. that actually happens in the book yeah um and it was to 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 get rid of all the nuclear weapons so that mankind could have a peaceful future yeah, yeah. um so so yeah that's it's very all, all, very all, very all orbiting nuclear weapons yeah. we should say not the ones on yeah. the ground because that would have killed yeah them. exactly yeah um, but it was very thought-provoking clark, clark had an image that in the future there will be a world government and peace would be kept on the earth by simply having thousands of nuclear bombs on orbit that you could drop on any transgressing nation. Yeah. Um, and that was his, that was his vision of the future because Clark was a pacifist mm. who was desperately, desperately trying to, you know, in everything he did promote peace among people. Yeah. Um, and, um, and that was his vision of the future, that there would be a world government. And if any country, rogue country, stepped out of line, they'd just have nuclear bombs dropped on them from orbit. Yeah, yeah. Because um, yeah, uh, uh, um, so, um, Royal was exactly the same. Yes. Um, he, he was very much a pacifist, and he wanted science for uh, the betterment of um, uh, human mankind rather than the destruction. So, now, here's a question again, for you, Dad. Yeah, go on. Do you know the connection between Sir Martin Ryle, astronomer Royal, as you said, uh, and the famous image of the black hole in M87? Do you know the connection there? Uh, no, I'm afraid I don't. Martin I may... Ryle invented VLBI, very long baseline interval. Oh, oh, you say that? Yes, he did. Yes, which meant yes. without him, there would have been no image of the black hole in M87. VLBI was is the technique to... to to link radio telescopes across the world so yeah, that they function right. as one big telescope. And he was the guy who came up with all the maths behind it, effectively inventing it. So without Sir Martin Ryle, uh, there'd have been no image that, uh, of that wonderful black hole in M87. So, yeah, because he was one of the pioneers of radio telescope, wasn't he? Yes, he, he was. He was. He's yeah, a so very, cause... very brilliant man, Sir Martin yeah. Ryle. Because that's how he got involved with um, Jocelyn Bell and... Uh... Anthony Hewish in that. Yeah, okay, yes. thanks for that. That's an And I have to tell the listeners, if you haven't heard Daz's wonderful programme all about uh, Dame Jocelyn Bell Burnell, it's available on Astro Radio. Um, look it up. And um, because it was a great programme, Daz, you did, you did a great programme. So we move on this week to B and um, looking forward to this. And it's going to be interesting to see. I wouldn't mind betting that we've made some identical selections here because mm. don't, don't forget, dear listeners, that I don't know what Daz has chosen and vice versa. So we'll see how we get on. Um, do you want to start, Daz? Uh, I'll let you start. I started last week, so okay. you can start All this. Right. So can get up. Okay, so B is for, and this is going to be really predictable, black holes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a surprise. There's what a are surprise. your favourites? <laughs> but I want to approach this from a different angle. I want to dispel some of the misconceptions about black holes. You, you know, we could talk for days about black yeah, holes, but yeah. there seem to be so many misconceptions about black holes. Uh, and I just like to, you know, just like to tell tell the listeners, you know, what, what, what the case really is, what the truth is. Yeah. 
So the first min- misconception, now, Daz, I'm sure you've heard this one. Black holes have gravity so strong, not even light can escape. Yeah. Yeah. This yep. is a complete misconception. It is true that light cannot escape from a black hole, but the reason it cannot escape is not because gravity is like some, I don't know, magnet that reaches out and grabs the light and pulls back the photons to stop them leaving the black hole. Uh, Gravity doesn't work like that with a black hole. The reason that light cannot escape a black hole is because inside the black hole, within the event horizon, the gravity is so strong that it bends space-time, and it bends it so much that it goes round in a circle. So from a photon's point of view, a photon inside the black hole can only follow a circular path inside the black hole and can never go out beyond the event horizon. As far as the photon is concerned, it's following a straight path because light can only follow a straight path, but the space that it's traveling through is literally bent so much that the the photons just end up going round and round inside the black hole. Now, another way to think about this, if you think of a roulette wheel, a a ball in a roulette wheel, you put a ball in a roulette wheel, spin the wheel up, and the ball has no choice but to go round and round in the middle. The only way that that roulette wheel can escape from the uh, roulette ball can escape from the center of the wheel is if you accelerate the wheel and spin it so fast that the ball literally jumps out of the the wheel. Unfortunately, with a black hole, the speed that you would have to accelerate um to to photons to do that will be more than the speed of light so there's absolutely no way that they can escape the black hole they are forever doomed to just go around in circles inside the black hole so that's why light can't escape it's got nothing to do per se with the strength of gravity it's to do with the geometry of space-time which becomes so curved that photons follow a circular path inside the black hole and cannot escape excellent so that's don't they call the so, sorry to interrupt. No, no, go on. Is, is there there's, there's a name for the the lines, isn't there? The, the, a, a photon or photon. Is it geodisks or something like geodesic. that? Geodesic, geodesic, geodesics. Yeah, yeah, yeah sorry, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, it can only follow geodesics inside the the black hole. But yeah. of course, as I said, the photons think they're traveling a straight line. Yeah, exactly. The space that they're traveling through is bent. Yeah, and that's because on such a small scale, the curvature looks like a straight line and it looks level. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, The second one uh, misconception, the second misconception is that the gravity of a black hole has sort of infinite range and strength. Now, you often hear people talking about the fact that, oh dear, the Earth might fall into the, se- the black hole at the center of our galaxy. It won't, and it never will. Because a black hole involves, um, or the black hole rather, obeys the same laws of gravity as any other object in the universe. There's nothing special about a black hole. In fact, black holes are probably the simplest objects in the universe. And um, because they have an event horizon, They have something at the center that we call a singularity, although I'll talk about that in a moment because that's another misconception. And they also have a spin and a charge. Not all black holes are charged, but let's say for argument's sake that they have charge. And with those four things, um, you can describe every single black hole. There's nothing more complex. So they do obey the same laws of gravity as the rest of the universe. And that is to say, the the gravitational field of a black hole obeys what we call the inverse square law. It falls off, the strength of the field falls off with the square of the distance. Uh, So, for example, if you move outwards from the Earth, you get to a point where gravity is half as strong. Then, with the square of the distance four times weaker, then 16 times weaker, and so on and so forth. What this means is that the black hole, for example, at the center of our galaxy, which is designated Sagittarius A star, there are about 100 stars that are held in orbits by the gravitational field of Sagittarius A star. Nothing outside that is going to fall into the black hole. 
And those stars, none of those stars are going to fall into the black hole, even though there are 100 of them, even though the closest orbiting star to the black hole at the center of our galaxy passes within a couple of light years of the black hole, its, its speed simply means that it's going too fast to be captured by the black hole's gravity. So you, listeners shouldn't worry about ever falling into a black hole. Black holes obey the same laws of gravity. If you were to replace our sun with a black hole at the same mass, it would have exactly the same gravity because gravity, the strength of gravity, depends on the amount of mass. If you put, I don't know, um, a billiard ball, um, the, the mass of our sun in the center of our solar system, we'd experience no change in the gravity whatsoever because gravity depends on mass. The strength of a gravitational field is related directly to the amount of mass of the object. So that was the other thing. And because of this, um, another misnomer, because people think that the, the black hole, a black hole's gravity reaches out to some sort of, you know, or is noticeable to an inf infinite distance. Um, I've heard people say that the Earth is orbiting the black hole at the center of our, our galaxy. Well, the Earth and the sun, obviously. Uh, and, and it's not true. It's not true at all. The stars in the galaxy apart from the 100 or so right at the center that are orbiting the black hole. But the other 200,000 million stars in the galaxy orbit the center of gravity of the galaxy. If you take the black hole out of the middle of the galaxy, you wouldn't no notice any difference at all in the motions of stars in the galaxy, apart from the ones right at the middle, as I said. So that was another misnomer. And lastly, um, this business of there being a singularity at the center of a black hole. Now, uh, a lot of people seem to think that a singularity is a thing. It's an object. It has properties. It would look like something if you were to see it. Singularity in science, the term singularity simply means we don't know what the hell goes on there. And oh, like black holes, black matter, black, black everything. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, like dark matter, dark energy. Yeah. These are all just, um, <sighs> just uh, terms, if you like. They're placeholders for the fact that we don't know what happens. Now, at the middle of a black hole, gravity and uh, time and space interchange so that time becomes space and space becomes time. So the theory has it anyway. We don't know these things, but this is what comes out of the maths. Conditions get so extreme that the laws of the universe that we're familiar with, governed by Einstein's relativity in terms of gravity, they cease to apply. And that is what we call the singularity. It's simply a place rather than a thing where the laws of physics, they don't break down, they still apply because they're still in our universe, but we don't know what happens yeah. because when you try and do the calculations, they shoot right off the scale. And whenever you, and they go to infinite quantities. So it's often said that this singularity has infinite density and infinite mass. Well, whenever you get infinity in physics, it's an indication that you've gone wrong somewhere. Yeah. Because infinities really don't exist in nature as far as we know. Or I would like to venture the suggestion that they don't exist in nature. Certainly at the minute of a black hole, Everything we know about the universe, all the laws that govern the universe simply cease to apply. And we exactly. don't. Exactly. The mathematics breaks down, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. Our maths breaks down, to, our physics breaks down. Yeah, you have to divide by zero, and mathematicians don't uh, like that. Yeah, I know. I know. Work. Do you want to know the most depressing thing about that, Daz? Go on then. We will never know. No. Because you can send a probe into a black hole or a person, uh, uh, if you don't like them. Uh, to find out what's happening in there, but they cannot return any information. Um, who was it? It may have been Asimov or somebody described a black hole as the universe's ultimate sensor because no information can leave a black hole. So we will never know what there is in the middle of a black hole. If an astronaut was brave enough to go in, they'd say, oh, look at that. But they couldn't report that. No. So we will never know. The only way we're going to approach this to find out what's at the center of a black hole is mathematically. 
Uh, uh, then you get to the yeah. point where the maths just doesn't work anymore, and anything yeah. after that is pure conjecture. And this is where we basically you come to the conclusion that uh, unless there's something startling comes along, somebody amazing like Einstein, we have a new complete theory, then yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll never know, as you said. Well, yeah. it is said that what physics needs at the moment is exactly what you said, a new Einstein. Mm -hmm. We probably have all the observations we need to understand all these weird and bizarre things. We need somebody to pull them all together and to yeah. see the relationships between them and say, this is how it works. Because um, we are reaching the point in physics where practic the practical experiments that you can do and the observations you can make to not prove a theory, because you never prove a theory, you just refine it. But to confirm that's probably what happens, um, we're reaching the point where our observations are no longer sufficient and for example, does uh, string theory. String theory yeah. cannot at the moment be tested by observation or experiment, even though there's, there are many good reasons for thinking it might be the explanation of the tiniest yeah. forms of matter. It was, it was a big thing, wasn't it, years ago, string theory, but because it's, well, it, it's impossible to yeah. uh, observe or test at the moment, then uh, it's still there on the back burner, but we don't know. And the worst thing about string theory is there are many classes of string theory and they can't mm. all be correct. But the proponents of each type of string theory will tell you, no, no, this one is the correct one because A, B and C. And the, the next person will say, no, 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 this is the, the correct version. So uh, there are a lot of big questions that we yeah. will not answer until we have what is called a quantum theory of gravity. Now, we need this because Einstein gave us a new way of looking at the universe in terms of the relationship between time and space. But this was on the scale of the very big people, stars, planets, galaxies. Quantum mechanics gave us the realm of the very small so that we understand what happens at the subatomic level. Quantum, quantum mechanics is probably the most successful scientific theory of the last century. The problem is that quantum mechanics and relativity do not talk to each other. They no. don't want to know each other. Yeah. They will not be unified. Every time you try and use the equations of, of uh, quantum mechanics and you apply them to the scale of the very big instead of the very tiny, it, the, the math just goes off to infinities and vice versa. So we believe that somewhere there must be common ground between relativity and quantum mechanics because it's inconceivable that there could be two sets of laws which govern the universe. That which affects big things like us and stars and planets and galaxies and whatever, and the very tiny, the quantum world. It's, it makes no sense that there will be two sets of laws that, that govern the universe. Somewhere they must meet. And the place where they do meet is at the center of a black hole. Mm. But we don't know yeah. what happens. And until we have a quantum theory of gravity, which Einstein started working on. So, you know, we're talking 70 years ago, scientists were thinking about a quantum theory of gravity. We've got nowhere or virtually nowhere. Yeah. You know, even while I've been alive, there've been so many blind alleys in, in a quantum theory of gravity. Uh, somebody saying, oh, this is it, this is it. And then it's not and you move yeah. on to the next one. I don't honestly think we're much closer towards a quantum theory of gravity. Well, no, it's, uh, unfortunately, as you said, there's been so many dead ends and so many observations that we can't explain. Yeah. And we're also beginning to question whether or not what we do know is correct. Absolutely. Um, with Mond and things like that. Um, yeah. But um, we do need this Einstein-like yeah. person who's able yeah. to pull all this together. Pull it all together, yeah. Because I, I really believe... And, you know, I'm not a professional scientist, so this is just my opinion based on, you know, what I read and uh, who I talk to. But I really believe that we do have perhaps all the observations we need, that the, the answers to these big questions are lying in the observations somewhere. We need somebody with the intellect yeah. of Einstein, but not just the, the, um, not just the intellect, because Einstein's great gift was to draw connections between things yeah. that other people had never seen before, like he did with, with space and time.
yeah. which people always thought were two separate things, but then it turns out they're unified in, in one thing we yeah. call space time. So until that person comes along and they might be at school now, they might mm -hmm. even be working in a supermarket somewhere, who knows? But until that person comes along, I don't think we're going to make much more progress with with uh, with quantum gravity. There is another way we can find out, and that's if we get an os obelisk up here somewhere. Ah, that's true. Uh, yeah. That be great? That yeah, be great? exactly. Perhaps we should start <laughs> scanning the craters of the moon for ultra strong magnetic fields. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Probably just find a chunk. All of right iron. then. So that's uh, that's uh, the misconceptions about mm. black holes. Um. Right. Okay then. Um. Talking about obelisks and 2001, and mm -hmm. I said there, there is a link. Do you know what a Bracewell probe is? Um, I would be lying if I said yes. Okay, then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, find something you don't know. Um, right, so basically, we're, we're, it's um, back to um, E.T. and uh, all that. Um, and aliens a bracewell probe is a hypothetical now th these exist mostly in science fiction i must admit right but they could have a because um as, as well as we've got um as i said seti which is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence mm -hmm. we've got uh, another group that call themselves seta which is search for extraterrestrial artifacts so uh... they're looking for um things of past of uh, civilizations they're looking for artifacts that they've left behind or they've sent into space like I, Mwama, for example yeah like yeah exactly you took yeah. the words right out of my mouth i'm glad you did actually <laughs> so, wow, 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 i'm wow. a notorious word thief <laughs> yeah um and uh of course they they consider them to be um probes well now, of course as i was saying uh a bracewell probe is a hypothetical concept for an astronomer, uh, for uh, auto to auto autonomous uh, interstellar space probes dispatched for the express purpose to communicate with one or more alien civilizations. Mm. It was proposed by Ronald Bracewell in the 19th, in a 1960 paper as an uh, alternative to interstellar communication between widely separated civilizations. Right. Now, these, these probes um and there's also different types of um these these probes but basically what they are is that these are probes that have been sent out by um civilizations light years away with the intent as it said to contact other civilizations or to find civilizations i see now these uh, probes uh they can either be rigged with just a simple message of saying we found you we'd like to talk to you come and have a chat with us and there'll be some directions of how we can do this or something like that sure. i.e as in the film contact yeah um or they could be preloaded with all that super all that civilization's knowledge ah, and that knowledge could then if they think we're intelligent enough or worthy enough could be downloaded to us so we would instantly get all their technology all their history um and everything like that that would be interesting and and is it, what it is is also these probes can sit and watch as i said oh. this is all science fiction at the moment yeah yeah sure. but like as you're talking about the obelisk in uh, 2001 mm. you're talking about a mua mm -hmm. um uh because that was considered to be the but what it is is these things can sit and watch if they detect a civilization i.e through radio signals or whatever they can then sit at a distance and watch and see what we're up to. I see. And then what they will be doing is they will be uh, fitted with artificial intelligence. So they'll be able to think for themselves and they will decide whether or not we are worthy, basically, of contact or of further communication or something like that. I see. Um, there is also some that will be self-replicating so they can rebuild themselves mm -hmm. and increase the chance of spreading the news even further and, and faster. Um, and they're called uh, Newman um, Bracewell probes. Ah, oh, yes, I have heard so of they, that. They, yes, so they can, probes, they can yes. replicate themselves. Um, and, but um, if a Muamua was one of these such probes it obviously found us not very interesting because it just sailed straight by 
So, uh, you know, Unless it's, it was uh, just collecting data. And, uh, yeah, you never know. It could have been. It had no um, purpose apart from collecting data. Yeah, and we were sort of like too primitive um, to uh, uh, be, be considered of, uh, worthy. But also, this can also, they can be bringers of doom. Uh, because there is another type of probe, which is exactly the same. It's a Bracewell probe but with the subtitle, a berserker probe. Oh my God, that doesn't sound and, very good. Yeah, exactly. And what these probes are, is they will go out into space. They will do the, they will do the analysis. They will sit, see whether or not the civilization is worthy of contact. Yeah. It will then contact this civilization. And then it will give it a preset questions to be asked. Right. And the response to the questions will decide on whether or not what, what the, the reaction will be. And this probe, if it thinks that we are not worthy or we are troublesome, which unfortunately we are because yes. we're separated and as a civilization, we are out totally, uh, as a human mankind is separated by physics, uh, by, sorry, politics, <laughs> oh, uh, religion. Um, yeah. and we go to war. We like to kill each other and things like that. We're a bit if brutal. it thinks, yeah, we are a bit brutal. We're, we're, we're ununified. And of course, um, mm. uh, any, uh, alien that would like to contact us, would like to be talking to a, a world, as one, not as separate nations and all True. that. We're, we're, we're um, too tribal. Yeah, too tribal. Exactly. Um, and what this um, probe can do, if it does, if it thinks that we're not worthy and we are possibly a threat to other civilizations mm -hmm. out in Interstellar, it will basically destroy us. It will detonate um, itself, uh, probably with a yield of something like 500 megatons, and it will completely destroy all civilized all the the, pop, the population of the earth oh, that's that's and, great yeah and these these are called again another be a berserker probe so we better so, hope that you know, uh, I mean, in terms of the questions it would ask us um you know would it be things like who won the 1956 fa cup final um, uh, not quite no not it might quite, be sort of like no. mastermind okay. it would possibly be philo philosophical questions but but, but, um, but therein lies a problem surely because what alien civilization could ask us questions that would be meaningful exactly to us? exactly if we can't answer the questions because we don't understand what they're asking us yeah uh, we're going to go poof yeah through, exactly. through no thought through no thought of our own yeah so Yes, it was just, as I said, don't lose any sleep, anybody. No, 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 definitely not. Because no, these, these, are, these, are, these yeah. are hypothetical objects in science fiction. Yeah. And it, it's, 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 like I said, it followed on from the film 2001, where the opposite obelisk came down. Uh, yeah. The chimpanzees felt the stone, and all of a sudden they knew how to use tools yeah. uh, and things like that. So it's it's just but that is a brace so b was for the bracewell probe which is a um a hypothetical probe sent by aliens to basically contact us or destroy us just in case any of our listeners uh, don't know what to own one what is or was is presumably it's still in the solar system this was an object that passed through our solar system how long ago three years ago now think yeah two or three years ago yeah no yeah 2018 this was an object that was caught as it was on its way out of our solar system but it had swung by the sun about they reckon about 400 feet long cigar shaped didn't look like a comet didn't look like an asteroid and to make matters even more interesting as it was getting further from the sun it was actually accelerating seemingly under its own steam now, there have been lots of explanations put forward for Oumuamua. Um, the, the latest one says it's a chunk of nitrogen ice that was ripped off a planet in some sort of planetary impact and has been floating through space ever since. And the fact that it accelerated was probably due to outgassing, that is to say, the sublimation of uh, its surface ice um straight to gas sublimation is the process where solids turn to gas without a liquid state in between and that was the push that gave uh that made umwamwa accelerate lots of different theories but of course one of them was you know um, a bracewell probe it was a it was an observation probe from another 
star. It definitely came from another star and uh, it was definitely interstellar. But yeah. um, because we only found it when it's on its way out of the solar system and it's too faint to observe now, I don't think we'll ever know the answer. So we have to keep watching the skies, as it were, for, for others. Do you, okay. do, you, do you consider the Voyager probes and the Pioneer probes as being Bracewell probes? Because the, well, the Voyager had the disc, the gold disc, yeah, uh, with uh, welcomes from the, the universe. Um, and the Pioneer had its plaques. Yes, that's um, right. Do you think they were sort of like um, primitive? I, mean, I suppose in a general sense they were, yes. Yeah. Although with one important difference, they weren't, they weren't launched with the express intention of contact. No, no, exactly, yeah. yeah. They were, they were the, to um, observe the planets in the solar system. Yeah. And, so I know the Pioneer plaques caused a hell of a lot of control. Oh, they did, because it they? featured a naked man and a woman. Naked man, and they are considered pornographic. They also yeah, looked know, too, too white in nature. I think, I think um, not who, who considers a, uh, a line drawing of a naked man and a line drawing of a naked woman pornography really need to get a yeah, sense of proportion yeah. in their lives. I mean, they even doctored the, the, um, the ladies' um, excuse the, um, genitalia. Yes. Uh, so it wasn't so pro prominent. That's right. Um, and also some people considered it to be feminist because um, uh, to considered it to be uh, uh, because the man had his arm raised Yes. Uh, whereas the females looked quite passive with her arms down and all that. It's sexist. Sexist, that's it, sexist, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, oh, okay. yeah it's interesting. Yeah, I suppose it's in one sense they are, because if they are ever picked up, as it were, by an alien civilization, we are, yeah. of course, talking thousands of years. Yeah, into thousands, 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 thousands of years. Uh, yeah. You know, um, I don't think they'd be, I don't think they're brace rod probes. I just think they're. You know, they completed their mission of giving us the wonderful yeah. images and scientific data from the yeah. planets in the outer solar system, and they left the solar system. And, that's and there's no intelligent uh, AI on them. And so, no, yeah. no, no, there's, there's no, not at all, not at all. Okay, then. Right. So, B, are you ready for this one? Go on then. B is for bowling ball. Okay. <laughs> right. So, Bowling ball. This is an image that's often used to illustrate the warping of space time. In other words, putting a bowling ball on a rubber sheet and the making a depression in the rubber sheet, which is meant to demonstrate the curving of space time when there is mass in it. And it's an image that is easy to understand. And in fact, it can, if you think of a bowling ball on a rubber sheet, making a depression in that sheet, that is the curvature of space time. But that actually has a good few explanatory powers as well, because people sometimes ask the question, why do the planets keep orbiting the sun? Why don't they just fly off? And the answer is, if you think of the sun as the bowling ball making a depression, and in terms of uh, physics, that depression is actually called a gravitational well. And the planets go around the sun because they are trapped in that depression. Exactly as I was saying earlier with the roulette ball, it's trapped inside the wheel. So the planets cannot exit the wheel because they're not going fast enough. But if their angular momentum was such that they were moving a lot faster around the sun, yes, they could fly off into the depths of interstellar space. But the planets are kept orbiting the sun simply because they are following a, a near circular path around a, a gravitational well. And if it helps you to think of an actual well or depression, that's great. The only problem with the bowling ball analogy, and it is just that it's an analogy, is that it's an analogy because it only shows space time bending, if you like, in one direction. But in fact, mass any mass in space causes space time to bend in all directions, not just downwards like a bowling ball on a rubber sheet. This gives us problems in visualizing what's going on because we have to think in higher dimensions. Now, we know that we have three spatial dimensions and one of time. So we live in a four dimensional universe as far as we can see. But to understand the curvature of space-time, you need to think one dimension higher. And the 
object that's uh, often used to demonstrate this is a thing called a hypercube. Have you come across a hypercube? No, it doesn't ring yeah. a bell. Well, a hypercube, if you think of extending the corners of a cube outwards so that they, they join up and form another cube with the smaller cube inside it, that's a hypercube. Yeah. And the, the second cube are the extra dimensions that we can't perceive. We can't see that cube because we can only see our three dimensions. You need to think in higher dimensions. In fact, in Paris, they've built a building as a representation of a hypercube. You can go and see it. Okay. And um, again, it's a representation. It looks like a cube within a cube joined at the corners. And um, these are the extra dimensions of space time that we need to get our head around to understand exactly how mass warps space time. The only problem is we can't. It's beyond our little brains to, to visualize it. Yeah. Um, if you look at string theory, string, uh, depending which flavor of string theory you want to look at, it's often said that, um, or string theory says that, in fact, the universe is nine dimensional as a minimum. And when you ask the question, so I can't get my head around this, why are all these, where are all these extra dimensions? And the answer string theory gives you is that they are just rolled up very, very small and we can't see them. The analogy that's often used is if you think of a garden hose that you're seeing from, say, I don't know, 500 feet away. From 500 feet away, it looks like a flat, straight line. But when you get close up to it, you see that, in fact, it's round. So from a distance, you can't see this extra dimension that the hose has. Uh, it goes from being two-dimensional to three-dimensional. Well, in the same way, string theory says that actually there are nine dimensions and the extra ones are rolled up so small, we can't see them, but they are nonetheless there. Now, just for our listeners' benefit, string theory is the theory that on a very basic level, on, the, on not even a subatomic level, much, much smaller than that, incomprehensibly smaller than that, the basic building block of the universe are tiny vibrating strings of energy. And depending on how they're vibrating, we perceive those vibrations as things like protons, neutrons, electrons, particles. So one type of vibration would give you a proton, another one would, would give you um, a neutron and so on. But they are vibrating in higher dimensions. And our perception is that we have particles uh, but in fact, if we could see these extra dimensions, we'll see they're just the, the manifestation. It's like taking, it's a very crude analogy. It's like, like um, taking a cross section through that garden hose, but not being able to see the rest of the hose. You would just see a flat circle. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, this is the same thing that, that we see our, the particles that we, we know about and we can measure and we can do big experiments with them at places like CERN. They are, um, in reality, in higher dimensions, and they are vibrating loops of energy. Well, some of them are loops, some of them are just strings. Um, but we are talking about the incomprehensibly tiny, the tiniest scale that you can imagine in, in the universe. Um, so, so there we are. So anyway, so that's that's the uh, that's the bowling ball. It's yeah, awesome. it's, it's it's a trouble with a lot of analogies, isn't it? That um, it's like the expanding Earth with the balloon. Yeah. Um, it uh, not only does the balloon expand, the, mm. which is supposed to be, represent the the, the space this, yeah. thing, you know, um, but that's two two dimensional layer that we see the outside yes is supposed to represent the three dimensional space yes that's right. um because also the as you blow it up if you draw um galaxies on it they expand as well well that doesn't happen no, so doesn't. analogies are good for explaining the basic mm. but you've got to as you said you've got to get this around your head and think in extra dimensions which may really makes it um, you know quite hard for a lot of people I'm, i know i struggle with it sometimes no, I, I struggle immensely our, our brains are not sufficiently involved or not involved in the right way um to deal with these concepts yeah and when you think about it does a hundred years ago the biggest numbers that people came into contact with in their daily lives could be perhaps measured in thousands and yeah. now we have to deal in millions billions trillions yeah. 
quadrillions. Mm -hmm. We have to deal with light years and parsecs and, you know, enormously large. Our brains are just not not up for it. Perhaps they will be one day. Uh, yeah. But I think for the moment, I have great trouble struggling to to close my eyes and think of extra dimensions. It's exactly. very difficult. Exactly. It's very difficult. Well, but there we are, mate. So, um, so there we are. Over to you again. Okay, then. Right. I'm back to Earth with mine. Oh, right. And B is for the Barringer Crater. Ah, the famous Barringer yeah, Crater. the Barringer in, Crater. In, in Arizona. In Arizona, that's right. It's located in northern Arizona. Ah, northern arizona uh in the usa um and uh, you may not have you may have heard of it but if you haven't heard of it you've definitely seen it because it's been featured in so so many films um it, it appears and things like that so uh, and also it was used by nasa for training the apollo astronauts on uh, what to oh, expect when they're oh, you know dealing with sense, crazy things yes. that. yeah so uh, yeah. Yeah, um, uh, that's a good way. It's basically, it's, it's real, it's actually called, it was originally called uh, the Diablo meteorite, um, oh, yeah. which is which is a name given to the actual impactor. Right. Uh, because it's it basically, it's uh, adjacent, where it landed in the, in the desert, uh, was adjacent to the uh, Canyon Diablo. Um, so Canyon. Canyon of the, yeah, Devil's yeah. Canyon. Um and uh it's a crater it's um about three three thousand nine hundred feet in diameter which is one thousand two hundred meters mm -hmm. uh it's five hundred and sixty feet deep so it's quite a deep crater they made a big hole um, which is 170 meters uh, and the rim rises above the plain by 148 feet which is 45 meters. Wow. Um, and the actual center of the, the base of it is actually a, a whole mound of crushed rubble, um, uh, which is basically until you get, it's about 210 to 240 meters deep um, until you hit the bedrock. But one of the interesting features is when you see an aerial view of it, yeah, it's squared off. Um, squared it's off. not, per, it's not round yet. If you have a look at it, it's, it's actually a, almost in a square shape. Um, just with rounded edges. And I'll tell you something um, else amazing. Think... Sorry, I'll tell you something else amazing about it that you only see from the air. Weren't they lucky that it landed just next to the visitor center? Exactly. I mean, it was just so. I mean, it's like <laughs> I can never understand why the meteorites land in craters. I know it, it's it's amazing. It's isn't one it? of those amazing things, you know. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so lucky that this that this happens. Anyway, so um, why, why why do we know why it's squared off? That is really bizarre. Um, what they they said is they reckon it was uh, due to cracks in the geology already there. Right. So the shock waves were not able to and it just left it with this sort of like squared off uh, shape and all so that. i'm thinking about um it's it's not limestone i'm pretty sure the local geology i, I couldn't tell you what the geology but if, if you is. think of uh limestone limestone has um vertical and horizontal faulting if you like yeah, exactly cracks right. uh which are known as clints and grites believe it or not i think clint, okay, clints that's... are the clints are the vertical ones and grites are the horizontal ones but if you tap a, a a block of limestone, it will it will you know naturally fall apart. Fracture, and, yeah, fracture. Uh, fracture it. into. Well, what into were those things called? Clints and grites. Clints and grites. Yes. Yeah. Sounds like some horrible breakfast cereal or something. Or, like or that. a firm of solicitors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. So that's that's why they reckon it was. It's got this sort of like squarish shape. Is that it was due to. Um, uh, features already cracks in the the strata of the impact site um now the date that it, la uh, it, it the impactor actually hit mm. um it varies so much you it, it goes from five thousand years to fifty thousand years so it's something that you know it, it, you've got to take with a pinch of salt when you hear um uh what um what how old it is and all that but um because it varies so much yeah of course uh, it uh, oh excuse me <clears throat> i've got a frog in my throat now i think i think uh, i read um one estimate uh put it at only being eight thousand years old yeah yes yeah, so i've read as low as five thousand years um, old and all mm. that um but when it actually uh hit the plateau um it was uh 
what was it? the area was an open grassland dotted with woodland so uh, and it was in <laughs> in it was in inhabited by mammoths and giant grain sloths well not for long i mean that huh. certainly ruined their day when that came down didn't it just about. um the, the actual impactor was of a nickel and iron um makeup uh, and it was spread the actual impactor um totally disintegrated when it actually impacted yeah sure um we'll do. and it was spread over miles and miles and miles um and it was it was thought that when it first entered the atmosphere it was something like 160 foot across which is 50 meters but it lost half its um mass on the way down came, yeah, yeah vaporized on the on its way down mm. um, but when it hit the ground it was estimated that it uh, created an explosion equal to around 10 megatons of t80 uh, so it was uh, and uh uh, and like as I said, the the actual impactor was mostly vaporized on uh, um, on 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 the impact. Mm. Um, it's it was known about. It wasn't known as that actual um, meteorite uh, crater, um, but it, it, of course, it, it, the Amer uh, settlers as they spread across um, America, they came across it, and it had various names like coon mountain which is strange considering it's a hole mm. um coon butte uh and then it became crater mountain and then uh, meteor crater before it became the barringer crater after um a chap called daniel barringer first muted that the idea that it could have been a meteor um crater uh, before that it was considered that it could have been volcanic because quite close by there is some uh, volcanoes and some uh, yeah uh, yeah. They thought it was just sort of like a minor crater. Yes, I remember um, that it was it was initially thought to be volcanic in origin. Exactly. And then, of course, I'm going to do a bit of name dropping here. We had Eugene Merrill Schumacher. Uh, we course. know him, don't we? we um, know him. Yeah, and he confirmed it as um, a meteor strike by finding cosite and stichovite, uh, which are for rare forms of silica, which are, can only be formed... Um, where quartz bearing rocks have been severely shocked by an instantaneous overpressure in other words a huge impact sure. um uh, it can't be made in volcanic actions uh, the only place we find it man-made on earth is where we've had nuclear explosions so we've tested nuclear sites right, right. um so as you said yes it landed right next to the visitor center which um originally i think it was a post office if i remember right um oh, nice. and um yeah so you've got a tour if you want to visit it there as andy said there is a tourist attraction which was handily by mm -hmm. um uh, where they have a, a display of the meteor bits of the meteorite there's also a movie theater which shows the the history there's a gift shop if you want and there's observation areas um and you can also take tours of the rim weather permitting so yes that's the barringer crater that is my uh, Eugene Shoemaker, of course, uh, went on to make the observations of the famous comet that, along with uh, Mr. Levy, bears his name, Shoemaker-Levy yeah. 9, which crashed into Jupiter um, yes, exactly. in 1994, I think it was. Um, and we talked about this last week in relation to the fact that um, there have been impacts since observed on Jupiter. Um, oh, yes, you're an Australian chap, wasn't Yes, it? Mr. Yeah. Wesley. Yes, right, absolutely. Yeah. So the thing about the uh, Eugene Shoemaker was that um, he was a, a geologist and he more or less single-handed got other scientists to accept the idea that craters on the earth were meteoric rather than volcanic in, in origin. He had a struggle. Let's not forget as well that um, craters on the moon back in the 1960s, a lot of people thought they were volcanic. Yeah or exclusively volcanic in nature. The, the, the impact theory was not well formed at that time. Patrick Moore, for example, who um, did a lot of work mapping the moon that the Americans used for the moon landings, yeah. he firmly believed that the vast majority of craters on the moon were volcanic and obviously later shown to be incorrect in that thought. But because we hadn't been there, nobody had been there, there was no easy way of telling. They just looked like holes without any samples and without anybody actually going there to, to observe them, uh, you know, they could have been volcanic. Um, and the same on the Earth, that a, a lot of big craters are now, especially in the, the, the era of Earth observation, we're beginning to spot some huge craters from Earth orbit 
that are definitely yeah. meteoric rather than volcanic in origin. So there we are. Right then, Daz, back to me. B is for Bode's Law. Are you familiar with Bode's Law? Uh, I've heard of it. Right. Uh, remind me which law this is. Right. So this was a law put forward um, by uh, astronomer Johann Erlert Bode, who lived uh, from, nine, uh, from 1747 to 1826, and his colleague Johann Daniel Titius, uh, 1729 to 1796 and uh, it should more exactly be called the Bode Titius law as it is in some circles <laughs> and they came up with a so-called law uh, which says basically says that going outwards from the sun each planet should be twice as far from the sun as the one before it so there's this relationship in distances that um, that they noted now, it has to be said, first of all, this is not exact because, you know, in those days they didn't know the exact distances to the planets. But it, it's fairly, a fairly good rough estimate that each planet going up from the sun is twice as far away from the sun as the one before it. Now, this all fell apart with the discovery of Neptune, <laughs> which didn't <laughs> obey the Bode-Titius law at all. However, there have been... Uh, modifications made to Bose law, which which encompasses the distance to ne Neptune and Uranus. Now, a lot of astronomers think this is just a coincidence, that it's not a law, that it just happens to be like that. But here's the interesting fact about Bode's law. When we look out at other stars, it seems that exoplanets orbiting other stars also seem to obey Bode's law. Okay. And there are so many observed cases of this that it cannot be put down to coincidence oh so there really right. does seem to be a rule that um the distance of a planet from its star is twice as much as the previous one now um two astronomers called de Brul and grainer um have shown that in fact this is a real thing and it may arise from the way that planets form around their stars in terms of resonances related to the mass of the planets. Mm -hmm. um, but as yet, they haven't got a, uh, you know, a hard and fast rule about this. Um, right, but okay. I thought that was really interesting, that a law that was, you know, uh, criticised for being a load of nonsense, basically, by astronomers, may actually hold true. Yeah, so it's that's... Yeah, because there was also, it was considered um, back in, in the day, sort of like I think about Victorian times, they say for argument's sake, I'm probably wrong. Um, but um, they thought that because the Earth had one moon, in theory, Mars should have two moons, yes. and then Jupiter should have four moons, um, oh, and yes. then so on. So the, the, it was multiples of the, the oh, uh, of their choice. Yeah. yeah it was, and it, what it was is if you read Gulliver's Travels, yes, the Lilliputian, I think it's the Lilliputian, uh, a, a scientist and astronomers, yeah. uh, predict that there are two, um, and of course, this is before they've been discovered, there was two, um, uh, planets mo orbiting, um, uh, uh Mars right um so um and they also mentioned a how what their orbits would be and of course when they were discovered they were found that they weren't that far off um right. and because and that was all due to the fact that they believed that mars would have two two moons but and in fact some of the craters have been named after the, the author and that so yeah and some but of the, i think the, i'm also yeah. right in saying this rings a bell somewhere that jonathan jonathan swift also that's right yeah wrote that one of the moons would orbit in a different di in the different direction to the other yeah he probably did yeah it's probably so one of them would be normal one of them would be retrograde and in fact that's exactly what we have with phobos and deimos they orbit <clears throat> mars in different directions yeah so yeah. uh what a guy, basically. Yeah, exactly. Um, it, 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 it's sort of like it was along with the thinkings that were going on at the time. So, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I, no, hadn't real, I hadn't realised that his prediction of Phobos and Deimos were down to that. So that's really interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, if you, if you read Gulliver's Travels, it's all in there. So, yeah. Yeah. I the haven't read it since I was a child. Perhaps I should reread yeah. it. First astronomical book, obviously. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> right. My turn. B is for Beehive. 
Beehive. Ah, oh, yeah, we're into beehive. insects now. Okay, fine. Yeah, Carry we're on. We're into insects, yeah. Little little things go around collecting pollen and things like that to make honey. Um, this is a, the beehive cluster. It's M44, and it's also another designation is NGC2632. Right. Now, in the last show, we briefly talked about the great, the giant globular cluster in Hercules, or yep. the great, the great we globular did. cluster, sorry, yep. there, M13, which we said was a tight ball of ancient stars. Well, the Beehive cluster, M44, is the other type of cluster that we know of, which is an open cluster. Right. Uh, open clusters are made of very young stars. Um, in this case, with the beehive, they're around six six hundred and twenty five million years old. So you know, very young. Oh, very young then. Yeah, yesterday. Like. Yeah, yeah, yesterday. Yeah. yeah. Um, the distance from Earth is around uh, five hundred and seventy seven point three light years. Um, no, so not that far away either. No, no, it's not that far away. Um, and as I said, the stars are very young. But all the, what these clusters are thought to be, they're all they're, these clusters. Um, are thought to be born in the same stellar nursery Bye. and they could number in hundreds or thousands um and then what they do is they sit there all doing their thing and all that mm. but they're, they're close enough together to still have a gravitational interaction with each other right but interesting they, they do have their own individual um have their own individual motions which means eventually and slowly but surely they will move apart from each move other apart. as in um like hades in in taurus which is now so d diffuse in nature that it's possibly going to drop off the cluster catalog sort of thing right. so they'll move away from each um e each other and there'll be no longer be a cluster I mean, it's like the pleiades and that yeah um but back to the beehive as i said it sits in the constellation of cancer um and it's been known since ancient times uh, it was possibly catalogued by uh, Hipp Hipparchus, Hipp Hipparchus mm -hmm. in uh, 113 BC. Wow, long uh, time ago. And then again by uh, Ptolemy in 130 AD. Oh, uh, nice. In 1609, Galileo used his telescope to find 40 of approximately 350 stars present in the cluster. Oh. Now, I'm spoiling you with this one Go on. because there is a second beehive a second and one it, yes and it's the southern beehive cluster which is in the southern hemisphere wow <clears throat> another open cluster i presume another open cluster um i'm just trying to find it it's ngc this is why i gave the ngc number on the, yeah. on the, the original one. ngc 2516 now this has hit the news just recently because using the gaia data because, um, of course, as I said, these stars, uh, these clusters slowly fall apart. Right. Because, as I said, everything is dynamic and everything's moving. Now, they, they understand that uh, they thought they would never be able to find the siblings that go with these uh, clusters. Yeah, because um, they all move apart. They all, all, all move apart. Yeah. So we're using the Gaia data and TESS. Mm. Um, they have been able to, by studying it, find tidal uh, streams of stars coming from the clusters and apparently they they they, they makes the i mean all, the clusters are sort of like quite bigger themselves that's why we can see them mm. um but this stretches them literally four or five full moons stretch which is gigantic that's in, huge in size, and yeah it's huge um and using the the, the the data they've been able to trace the um uh, trace the, the stars from the, the the beehive cluster, um, and they've done it by using different methods. They've dated uh, they've dated them. They've also found that they're traveling in the same direction at the same speed, and they have the same spin. So I'll leave wow. it there. So, yes, and that's in the southern constellation. So you got two for the price of one there. Wow, so that's, that's amazing. That's amazing. Okay, then. Right. Well, believe it or not, that brings us to the end of another program. So um, thank you, Daz, for sharing this with me. I think it's been uh, learned some interesting things today. Yeah, and I hope certainly our listeners have, uh, I hope you, the listeners, have enjoyed it as much as we have. We'll be back yeah. next week, of course, with um, the letter C. And um, until then, have a fantastic week. Uh, it's goodbye yeah. from me. And it's uh, 
yeah everybody stay safe and uh we'll look forward to seeing you next doing this all again next week thank you very yeah. much